Our Father, we thank you for how you've started with us since yesterday. We bless your name for how you've gathered us together this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the prayers we have prayed already. And we believe that you have answered and will see the manifestation. As we come here today and go from message to message to seminar to church growth, workshop, and other things we have to do today, we pray that you see us through in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that none of us will be left untouched. Amen. We pray that your hand will be upon everyone. Amen. So that, Lord, your purpose will be fulfilled in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Make us to hear what we ought to hear. And as we hear, we pray that the word will so affect us that we'll never be the same again. Amen. Make us better leaders that we may be able to lead your people aright wherever you place us in leadership. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. From John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 36, And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. This morning we are considering the message, Jesus, the Lamb, and the Lord. Jesus, the Lamb, and the Lord. This is a pastor's conference, and you need to understand that even though we know some things, we need to re-emphasize them, so we will know the message of the minister. Many of the things will be saying, or will not be saying them to feel, to make you feel that you didn't know them before. We believe that a lot of the basic things will be mentioned in here, either by myself or by other appointed leaders. We know that we may know these things, but then we need to re-emphasize them so that we'll be confident in the word of God and we'll be able to give balanced diet to the people we're leading in our various capacities of leadership. We're looking at Jesus here and we have just sung that Jesus is our message. In the chorus, we know him to be savior. We know him to be sanctifier. We know him to be healer. We know him to be baptizer in the Holy Ghost. We know him to be the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the coming King. Here, John saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he was coming, then John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We know the ministry of John. He is the one that has been sent forth, that he will proclaim the Lord. He will repair or prepare the way of the Lord. And he had been preaching repentance. And repentance is a wonderful message. It's a Bible message. From the beginning to the end, we see repentance. But I dare say that even though John had preached repentance, this was the chief of his message. This was greater than everything he had preached. Because if you preach repentance and you don't show the people the Lamb of God, that can take away the sin of the people. Repentance alone, without faith in the accomplished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary, cannot save the soul. Then John had spoken to the soldiers. He had spoken to the soldiers about doing works meet of repentance, that is, practical righteousness. He spoke to all the people that came, and righteousness is very important telling people and showing people how to live practical, righteous life is very, very important. 
But shouldn't we say, except we point to the Lamb, except we point to Jesus Christ as the one that will cleanse and blot away our sins through the blood he shed, then the message we preach will not be complete. Not only that, we know that John could have accepted privately that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. But then, before the people, he proclaimed like an evangelist ought to do. He proclaimed like a person preparing the way of the Lord ought to do publicly before the people. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And then, apart from proclaiming it in the midst of unbelieving people, before the public, he then proclaimed it later, even privately, before his own disciples. Let's see in verse 35. Again, the next day after, John stood and two of his own disciples, of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as a word, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Verse 37, And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Even when we are with people that have some knowledge of the word of God, even when we are with people, few they may be, that are already brought up in the strict rules and regulations of religion, the way they have been taught, if they have not known Jesus, we should still point them to Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. Here, John pointed to Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. How appropriate was this message to Israel? How appropriate is this message to the people of God today? How appropriate is this message in the church? And from the church to the world today, you remember from the very beginning when man fell, that God had to take a lamb or an animal and kill that animal and then close Adam and Eve with the skin of the animal. They needed covering. They needed the grace of God. And God did what he did, pointing to the future that eventually the lamb will come. You remember you are preachers like me, Abraham and Isaac, going to the place of sacrifice. And then there was no lamb. And Isaac asked and said, my father, here is wood, here is fire. Where is the animal, the ram or the lamb for the sacrifice? And then Abraham replied, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. You know, Exodus, when they were to come out of Egypt, and then God told Moses and Aaron, and said that they should take the lamb, or they should take the animal. And he gave the specifications and qualifications, and he should kill. And he killed the Paschal lamb, and they were redeemed. They were saved out of the Egyptian bondage. You remember the Levitical order and priesthood. You will remember how they were told to make atonement for sin by killing the animal. So the children of Israel already knew that if sin was to be taken away, they needed the blood of an innocent sacrifice. And all through, but Isaiah had given a prophecy. And in giving a prophecy about the sacrificial lamb, he had identified an individual, a person, in Isaiah chapter 53. But then they were looking. Eventually, I'm sure you will remember the prophecy of Daniel in the 70, in the 70 weeks of his prophecy when he said that the person coming that will be cut off, not for his own sin, but for the sins of the people, it will bring an end to sin, to iniquity. Eventually now, Jesus Christ appeared. And as Jesus appeared, then John pointed to him and said, Behold, Look at this. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What did he mean by the Lamb of God? Now, there are many things that were referred to as being of God 
in the Old Testament. For example, if you refer to a temple, you will say, house of God. You find that right in the Old Testament. If you refer to some people, you find that the Bible calls them man of God or men of God. And you find other things in the Old Testament that were referred to as the specific thing of God. In the mind of the children of Israel, what will that connote? What will that mean? It will mean it is the chief of such a thing. The greatest of the highest of such a thing. When we say the house of God, there are other houses. But of all houses, this is the chief. This is the greatest. When we say man of God, it means there are other men. But when eventually, you actually say man of God then it means that this is the chiefest among them all. The one that has a purpose, a calling, more than all the callings and the purposes of all the other people. When you say servant of God, now there are other servants all over in the world, but this is the chiefest of them all, the servant of God. And other things we may refer to as being of God in the Bible, then you know that those things are referred to as the chief as the greatest. And here, John said, behold, the greatest of all the sacrifices. This is a finality. This is a chief. The children of Israel have been seeing sacrifices. They have been slaughtering animals. And they have been saying that this will atone for my sin. He said, behold, the highest has come. The final has come. The perfect has come. The sinless has come. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I'm sure John knew at this time that the sacrificial system had been peculiar unto the children of Israel. And in many other places, apart from Israel, all the sacrificial systems had not been according to God's appointment. And uh, although some of the Gentiles, like when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in Babylon, history tells us that they influenced Babylon so much, and they influenced all the coming kingdoms so much, that some of the things that Israel taught, some of those things were still available uh, in Babylon, or some of those things were still available, they were still being practiced in the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. But then it was like a counterfeit because they didn't actually practice it the way the children of Israel practiced it. And the sacrificial system is one of those things. But then when you really think about it, the sacrificial system that God had given, the children of Israel by and large practiced it above all the other nations. So it was peculiar to Israel. Now John said, behold, this is not for Israel alone. Behold, this is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That from now on, when we proclaim Jesus Christ as the one that takes away sin, we're not proclaiming him as the one that will just take sin out of the nation Israel, or out of the people that will come out of the nation Israel, but from the whole world. Number two. When you say the lamp of God, what will John mean? What will John be referring to? He was referring to the fact that this is the lamp of God's appointment. Although God instituted a sacrificial system, but then he gave it into the hands of the other people, that is of the Levites and of the priests, to choose the lamb. He gave the qualification. He said the lamp must be without blemish. The lamp must be of this age. And this must be the things we're looking for in the lamp. You choose such a lamp and then you bring. In many cases, it's the person that is actually making the atonement for a sin that will choose that lamp. And then he will bring it. He lays his hands upon, upon the lamp. He confesses all his sins. Or if it is for the nation, the high priest will confess the sin of the nation. And then the sacrifice will be made. John said, this is different. It is not the high priest that chooses this one. From eternity past, God, before the foundation of the world, has chosen this. This is the Lamb of God. 
before the nations were formed, before the territories of the nations were decided, before we parted into this nation, that nation, this other nation, this one had been appointed of God before the foundation of the world. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so, behold, the lamb of God's appointment. And everything God had wanted to look for in his sacrificial lamb, which he couldn't see in a perfect way, in any of those lambs that had been chosen and sacrificed in the Old Testament, he saw in this one. This is God's lamb. And if the children of Israel had confidence that their sins were taken away just because they slaughtered that animal and shed the blood or put it upon the altar and just because they did everything God wanted them to do because of that lamb, this should give us assurance that when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because his blood has been shed for you and you come under the mark of that blood, you are covered and you are cleansed because this is the lamp of God's appointment. One is because he's the chief, the final. And we do not need any other lamp apart from this. We will never have another lamp better than this one. This is the chief, the highest, the greatest of them all that had ever come. And then two, this is the lamp of God's appointment. Number three, this is the lamp that God himself sent. You see, it's something to appoint, to choose, to select. It's another thing to send it forth at the right time. If you read the Gospels very well, especially if already we have established the fact that this means that Jesus Christ is, a, is the chief of all the sacrifices you could have thought of. Not only that, that is the sacrifice of God's appointment. Number three, that it is a sacrifice that God himself sent. I said that if you read the Gospels, especially the Gospel according to John, you will discover that many times over and over, it says he was sent by God. And that he that sent me is with me. And so John said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The children of Israel had confidence in the fact that God had established the sacrificial system and that if they went through it the way God appointed, they will be saved, they will be redeemed, and they will be reconciled unto God. And we have Old Testament evidence showing us that the Old Testament people were saved. They were redeemed. Their sins were blotted out. They had a new life, new nature. Their sins were forgiven and pardoned. And they became related unto God because of that redemptive plan. If that could happen to them under the old covenant, how much more when now we're called upon to behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The sin of the world. The Jewish people, in particular, they felt that the Gentile people and the Pharisees, uh, those who were leaders and rulers among them, they wrote this now in some of their writings. They felt that the Gentiles were so bad, their sins were so great, that their sins became unforgivable, that it was not possible to forgive all the sins of those Gentiles. In which case then, they said, the Gentiles are just being prepared as wood for the fire. But here John changed everything. He said, you think that the sins of Israel could be pardoned, but the sins of the world could not be pardoned because they are so great and so deep. They seem unforgivable. But then he said, behold, the Lamb of God, the greatest of all sacrifices, that can cleanse and take away any sin and every sin. Behold, the lamp of God's appointment. And God has so appointed that there is no sin that will be so great or so deep that the blood of this lamp will not be able to take away. 
that you thought that only Israel had some moderate sins, and because of a covenant with Abraham, whatever they have done, Israelites could be forgiven. But those Gentiles are past forgiveness and grace. He says, this is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Before we go on, you as a child of God, as a minister of the gospel, you should think about this very often. One, about yourself. That as you rejoice in the knowledge of salvation, as you rejoice in the fact that your sins have been taken away, keep on beholding the Lamb. You see, if you shift your emphasis away from Christ, and you begin to think of who you are, that the life you are living, and the things you are able to do, and you base your acceptance with God on your own merit, you may find that you go back into guilt and condemnation. Because you see, even as a child of God, even as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel, we still need that lamb. We still need that lamb. Behold the lamb of God. Never shift your emphasis, your look, your faith, your gaze away from the lamb of God. Until the very day you leave this world, keep on beholding the Lamb. Rejoicing in the Lord. That I know my sins are taken away, not because of my marriage, not because I qualify, but because of the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God's appointment. And the Lamb that God himself sent, that my sins will be taken away. If the, if the Lamb can take away the sins of the whole wide world then God should not have any trouble taking the sin of a single individual away. And whoever you are, why don't you just have confidence in the blood of that lamb? Because it is through that blood that we are cleansed. All our sins are blotted away. And we are covered and protected by the blood of that lamb. So I stand with John. And I tell you here this morning, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now let me talk to you as minister. You see many times as ministers, as preachers of the gospel, we go, we leave the simple message. We leave the things that are really very necessary and very basic and very important. And then we begin to talk on things that are very deep. And then we do not remind the people that we're talking to that the most important thing for them before they know any other thing, is that they will behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Can I therefore remind you that you are saint before the Lord Jesus Christ, so that you can call the world around you to come and look at Jesus by faith, to see him by faith. There are many things the Bible teaches, the Bible teaches a lot of things on practical righteousness, practical holiness, but I think you will believe, as I believe, that we misplace doctrine. When we talk to people who have not had faith in Christ, we talk to them about the fact that they must be holy. Because if we do that, they'll be thinking that in their own strength, by their own power, maybe they can be holy, maybe they can be righteous. But if the first message we give to them is, Behold the Lamb. They are guilty already. And their consciences afflict them already. If they are very sincere, they know that all the world is guilty before him. And that every mouth is stopped. Because by the deeds of the Lord shall no man living be justified. Therefore the first message we are to bring to them is behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. The Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Let us remind the people we are preaching to that their good works cannot take away their sin. Their works of generosity cannot take away their sin. They are joining our church cannot take away their sin. They are joining any other church cannot take away their sin. Or mass, the Catholic mass, or the sacrament, or any other sin apart from the Lamb. This Lamb of God. 
apart from this, there is nothing else that can take away our sin. A person may fast and pray and roll on the ground. A person may, re may refuse to wear shoes and be wearing white garment. A person may do every difficult sin under the sun so as to be redeemed and to be saved. But there is no salvation in any other. Behold the lamp of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You know, sometimes we are sent to a new community. And in that new community, you may see that their culture or their practice is different from the one you are familiar with. And then we begin to tell these people, we begin to preach the Bible to them. And we give them this idea and that idea and this other idea. Telling them, you must change. You must change. But understand, the uh, man cannot change himself. It's impossible for him. There's only one change agent. Only one thing that can transform him. Behold. Look at this by faith. Here is the lamp of God. Which taketh away the sin of the world. The sin of the world. As an evangelist. Wherever you are called upon to minister, here is the emphasis. The teacher may accuse you. And the teacher may say, you are not emphasizing this doctrine and that doctrine. Oh, you say, here, here we are in a crusade. And here are these thousands of people stretched out as eyes can see. That I believe, according to the Bible, that there is no other message suitable for these people that have never known Jesus. We cannot be teaching and preaching doctrine right there on the crusade field if we have not emphasized the fact that Jesus Christ is Savior. And so, on that crusade field, the evangelist owes each a duty to God, to Jesus Christ, and to the church, and to the people that are before him, to make them behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so, if you're an evangelist, or if you are ministering as an evangelist, wherever you are, here is, here is the emphasis of the evangelist's message. Behold the lamp of God. We take away the sin of the world. Or it may be you are not an evangelist, you are a pastor teacher. But then an evangelist is invited to your community. Or maybe to your very church. Maybe an evangelist from us here. And he comes to declare the message that the people actually need. Because you are a pastor teacher, and you have invited this evangelist, and actually you are having a crusade, and then he comes on, and all that he does, from every angle, is to make the people look up and behold the Lamb. He knows that as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And he just tells them, look and live. And from the first day to the last day of his uh, ministry there with you, all he's seen is the lamp of God. The lamp of God. The lamp of God. Behold him. See him. Believe him. Hold on to him. He taketh all the sins of the world away. And you as a pastor teacher, because you are a pastor, because you are a teacher, you might have wanted him to emphasize some other things so as to complement your ministry, so as to be able to assure these people that what you have been teaching them is actually the truth. But he didn't do anything like that because he was just manifesting the ministry and the calling of the evangelist. Don't get offended. That's the very first message the people need to know. And if it's a crusade, let us give the evangelists the chance to show them, behold, the lamp of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Not only that. I told you that publicly, John said this. And privately, John also proclaimed it. Verse 35, verse 36. Again, the next day, John, after John, after John stood and two of his disciples and Looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb. Privately, with, your, with the disciples that God is raising up under your leadership, with the workers. There are times we we'll need to bring reassurance to them. There are times we need to tell them, you know the devil is the accuser of the brethren. 
you know that even workers can be accused of the devil, accused of this, accused of this, accused of that. And if you will do like John, that even with those disciples, even with those workers, the people that have been raised up, that we do not only preach this and that and that, and all those things have their place, the things that the Bible has told us, commanded us to teach, but if there are times where we will tell these disciples and say, I know you believe in Jesus, I know you are born again, I know that you have trusted in the Lord, but look up, see Jesus again, and see the depth of the grace of God, of the love of God, of the covering we have in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we tell those disciples all over again, behold the Lamb, behold the Lamb. Then also, apart from the workers, you know sometimes in our own family, some of us that are children, you have wives. You see, sometimes our children, they may not find it easy to uh, believe the Lord because we have a high standard. We are preachers and we constantly tell our children, remember, your daddy is a preacher. Remember, your mommy is, you know, occupied in the work of the Lord in a very significant way. Don't let the family down. And we talk to these children, make, make sure that you keep the standard high. When we go to church, other people are watching you. Remember, you are the children of the pastor. You are the children of, you know, the leader here. And therefore, make sure that you behave right, you talk right, you do everything right. And eventually, we are, we're expecting adult behavior from children. But if once in a while, we're sure our children... And I'm sure those who are very close and near to us, behold the Lamb of God. Doctrine is good. Teaching is good. High standard of holiness and righteousness, it's good. And it has its place, a conspicuous place, an important place. But behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. In fact, this is a very gospel. And we must preach the gospel. This is the very foundation and the basis of the gospel. And this is the very center of the gospel. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's the lamp of God. He shall save his people from their sins their sins. We must emphasize the merit in that blood, the power in that blood, and the redemption that we have in that blood. In our messages, in the church, we must make sure that we put the emphasis on Christ from beginning to the end. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, from verse 18, for as much as ye know, that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily, truly, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these latter times for you. Therefore, we ought to realize that when we talk about salvation, we're not redeemed by corruptible things as silver and gold. It is not what the people do or what the people can do. I mean, by way of sacrifice, by way of giving, by way of buying salvation that will save them. But it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself the precious blood of Christ as of a lamp without blemish, without spot, that will cleanse the people from their sins. Let us emphasize it in our preaching. Even in the church, you see newcomers are coming to the church many times, or maybe every time. And if the newcomers never hear the gospel very clearly like this, that even though people have been sinners, yet if they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. How then will they be saved? That's why we sometimes find people that have been coming to the church six months, one year, they're not sure of salvation yet. 
people you say, but we preach salvation. Yes, we do. But maybe the aspect of salvation we have been emphasizing is repent. Don't misunderstand me. We must emphasize repentance. Maybe the emphasis we have been uh, putting on it is that there must be a transformation. There must be a change. Don't misunderstand me. There must be a change. But a change does not come before we know Christ. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, that's when the change comes. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. Therefore, we must show them how to come into Christ. How to believe on the Lord. It is when they behold the lamp of God that takes away the sins of the world. It is then this change and this transformation will happen, will come upon them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul the apostle said, I delivered unto you, first of all. First of all, will the church realize that when we come into a new community, when we come into uh, before a group of people that have never known the real gospel, the full gospel, or if we have the privilege of being invited to another assembly outside deeper life and god gives us the chance to go and minister unto them if we go there we may see a lot of things we don't agree with but they have called us so that we will be of hell and when you see those things you don't agree with i hope you don't take all your time emphasizing well this is not good this is not good this is not good there may be a place for that later, but first of all, first of all, don't they need to see the lamp of God? Behold the lamp of God, the love of God manifested on Calvary. Don't they need to see the grace of God, the riches of God at Christ's expense? What God can do for man in redeeming and saving man without his own merit? Don't they need that? Don't they need the cleansing? In the blood of Jesus Christ, first of all, don't they need the assurance that it is not what they do that will get them saved. It is what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. Don't they need the assurance that Christ is the lamp of God that will take away all their sins? Must we send them away with the idea that they are going to change themselves? They are going to transform themselves? I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. Therefore, let us make sure we emphasize this that Jesus is the Lamb, the Lamb of God. He died, and it is through Him we have redemption. Emphasize it in your life too. We don't pray and we don't expect that a minister will backslide or that a minister will commit sin. But should in case it happens accidentally, that a person who had been preaching the gospel finds himself that he does something wrong. You know something? When a preacher who has been, you know, preaching righteousness and holiness and say we must live right and live straight, when he finds himself doing something wrong, the devil is likely to come and say, there you are. And you will never be forgiven. Because look at what you have done. And it's likely to get into the valley of despondency. But hold on to this, should in case something happens you didn't expect. Should in case accidentally you are deceived, you are tempted, and you fall into what you never expected, you will fall into. Remember Peter. He had gone and he had prayed to other people because Jesus sent them out two by two. And they came back and they were very successful. And Peter was a very committed, consecrated person. You know what he told the Lord? And he meant it. 
He meant it that even if all these other people denied the Lord, he wasn't lying. He meant it. That he will never deny the Lord. But it happened. So we, we may not be able to tell. Here we are with thousands here. And we should give you this assurance that the Lord Jesus Christ is the lamp of the world. That's why John says, not for the sins of the world alone. You see, you see made a propitiation, but for our sins also. He says, little children, I write this unto you that you may not sin. Then he said, but if, we don't want anybody to sin here, but if, we like everyone to remain righteous and pure and holy, but if, if any man sin, we have an advocate for the Father. He is a propitiation for our sins also. So let us remember, Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Preach it. Believe it. Accept it. Stand on it. Any day, any time, the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse from every, every kind of sin. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, from verse 38, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. He said, the cleansing in the blood of those lambs in the Old Testament, they're limited. It's limited. But this one, it says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are justified from all things from which you could not even be justified by the law of Moses. In 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. From verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Remember that. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So we go back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 29 the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and says behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world already I've shown you from this verse that Jesus Christ is the Lamb that is the highest, the chief, the greatest. He was appointed by God, selected and chosen by God, sent by God. And his blood cleanses, and it cleanses completely and thoroughly. But then I need to tell you this, that since it is your responsibility and my responsibility, to emphasize the Lamb of God, taking the sins of the world away. How do you do it? And how will you be able to keep to this message everywhere you go? The secret is in that first line. The next day, John seeth Jesus. If you prepare before you give your message, and instead of seeing the cruelty, the carelessness, the sins, the inconsistencies, and all the bad behavior, the conducts of the people. You see, before you go to preach, you see too much of the world. And you see too much of the pain and the agony they cause in the world. And too much of the havoc they do, even in the church. If that is much of what we see, when you go there on the pulpit, 
because you have been concentrating on seeing this and seeing that, you can fire those people instead of presenting the land of God. I plead with you before you go to preach, remember you are a servant of God. Remember God has called you. Remember God wants to use you as an instrument, as a channel. Remember that God has a lot of people out there he wants to bring in here. Remember you are responsible to God. Don't let what you see in your community take over your mind and take over your heart. Before you go to preach, see Jesus again. Behold him again yourself and see his beauty and see his glory and see his grace and see the love demonstrated on Calvary. Every time before you go to preach, you know, even sometimes before you preach to your wife, see Jesus. You know, because you see much of your wife every time. I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like that. If that's all you see and you like to help your wife, know the Bible. If you are not careful, your wife may not want you to be preaching Bible to her directly. Your wife may say, I hear enough. After all, you are my preacher in the church. I hear enough in the church. You know why she's running away from your preaching? Because you see much of her before you preach. See Jesus before you preach to her. And the people that are very close, you know, the workers. The workers, you know, some of these workers, some of them, we like them to change. We like them to become better. And, you know, sometimes we see what they do and it makes us unhappy. And we ought to be unhappy when we see something that is not good in all. But don't let them block Jesus from your view. Let's see Jesus. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him. Oh, and he said, Behold. This is the greatest, the most beautiful thing you can see. Behold. And this is the greatest thing that when you see, it will, you know, it will just wipe away all your sorrow and all your guilt and everything. Behold, the lamp of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, Crosby was a woman. She's dead now, long ago. And a preacher too. And a singer. But she was blind. She couldn't see. But she was the first woman in America that was able to go to see the Senate. Able to talk to the people. And presidents will call her. And she will give her word. They respected her so much. But then somebody confronted her and said, you are called for almost everywhere. And people respect you. But how is it? Are you not unhappy and sorrowful that you cannot see anything at all? Even though we know people respect you. And you are a servant of the Lord. And you are serving the Lord this way. And people call for your counseling, for your advice, for preaching, for singing, and all that. Are you not ashamed that you are blind and you cannot see the rising of the sun, the beauty of this universe and everything like that? And uh, she said, no, that I am in a better position than you are. You see many things, but think about it. The first person I will see directly will be the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. That when I leave this place, and I go from this realm and go up there. You have seen many things that have caused you sorrow and heartache. But the very first face I will see will be the face of Jesus Christ. If we are privileged, we have two eyes to see. Why don't you see more of Jesus? More of Jesus every time. It will help your ministry. It will help the way you minister. It will help your usefulness in the church of the living God. John seeth Jesus. May we see Jesus more and more in Jesus' name. Now I said yeah, I was going to talk on Jesus, the Lamb, and the Lord. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. Reading from verse 30. I and mean, brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. And he spake unto him 
the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus. Believe on Jesus as Lord. And then you will be saved. In Romans chapter 10, from verse 8. But what says it? The word is not thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, thou and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you take him as Lord. Is the lamp that took away the sin of the world. But remember, it is that same lamp of God that is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Though it's lamb, because of sacrifice, because of redemption, because of the function and the role he has to play in forgiving sin and saving the world. But when you talk about the kingdom, he is the king, he is the lion. He is the Lord. And because he is the Lord, we ought to accept him and believe him and receive him as such. The Lord Jesus. Make him the Lord of your life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, from verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. It says, now that we realize that Christ has died for us, henceforth we do not live unto ourselves anymore. That means we do not control our lives alone by ourselves. Now it is Christ that controls us. His word controls us. He directs us. He leads us. And his word has final authority and binding upon every one of us because he is the lamb. That's what brings us to the kingdom. But then he is the Lord. That's what keeps us in the kingdom. We are always under his control. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Luke chapter 6, verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? We should assure Christians and teach Christians that the Christians are not to live to themselves. Every word we speak, every action in our lives, every decision we make, let's make Jesus Lord. And we who are teaching them, we who are preachers of the gospel, let us understand we are servants of God. We are men of God. And because the Lord has sent us, we are responsible unto the Lord. Therefore, we are under the control, the authority, and the lordship of Jesus Christ every time. So that we do not come under the charge, under the condemnation of what Jesus said. Why are you calling me Lord, Lord? And yet, you do not do the things which I say. I pray that God will help us much more so that everything he has been telling us will be able to do and obey in Jesus' name. That will be like the first apostles that said that they would rather obey God more than men. And that God will help us as we proclaim and preach Jesus Christ as Lord. That we will live under the authority and under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue that shall confess that he, Christ, is the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That as the Lord has made us to see the very center of the message. That we are to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lamb. We are to proclaim him as Lord. That God will grant us the grace. As we go into the ministry, go back to the places of God's appointment. That we will emphasize Jesus Christ as Lord. 
Jesus Christ as the Lamb, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The blood of Jesus will cleanse every sin. God will forgive on the merit of Christ. God will forgive on the merit of Christ. Let us be assured of that ourselves. And let us assure the people of it. He is the Lamb of God. The sacrifice he made is acceptable to God. God appointed him as the Lamb. Preach it. Preach it. The world needs that message. That it should behold the Lamb of God. Emphasize it. The guilty world needs that message. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And let us make him Lord. Let us crown him Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you have taught us this very morning. We rejoice because we can see Jesus as the Lamb and as the Lord. We praise you because as the Lamb, He is the one that taketh away the sins of the world. And we thank you because by His sacrificial love and death on the cross of Calvary, our sins have been taken away. Heavenly Father, as ministers of the gospel, help us to minister to the people and bring them to the point that they be able to see Jesus as the Lamb that can take away every sin from their very life in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God in heaven, we are praying this morning that you help us as well to see Jesus as the Lord. The Lord over the universe, the Lord over our life, the Lord over our ministry. We are asking, Lord, that you will take absolute and perfect control of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. And we are asking as Lord, you will guide, you will lead, you will direct, and you will pattern us according to your perfect will in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we are asking that in our administration, make us to see that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Lord, we pray that you will help us to see more of you. That in the privacy we see you. In the public we see you. Amen. And we are asking, O oh God, for greater manifestation of yourself unto ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to stay back for I just thank God for all this provision. I just Great.